What's up, everybody? Welcome to Off the Rails, a recovery podcast dedicated to ending the stigma of addiction through open discussion on all things recovery related. My name is Mark, and with me always are Dave and Jared. And today we have a very special guest who Dave is going to introduce right now. Yeah, we're, uh, we're really excited to have uh, our next guest on. Uh, when we actually started the podcast, she was one of the first people we wanted to get on. Um, she's the author of the book High Achiever, which is an amazing, uh, amazing read. There it is there. And uh, we're just so fortunate to have her on to join us today and talk about uh, her past struggles with addiction, uh, her recovery journey and all that she's up to these days. So please welcome Tiffany Jenkins. Yay. Hi. Thank you for having me and for all the nice stuff you said. I appreciate it. Yeah, Thank I just want to first. Us. I just want to say first before I forget that I uh, I cheated a bit and I downloaded it on Audible, and um, but I didn't know that you you did the narrating for it, right? I did. Yeah, it's you did it so incredible. obnoxious. I, I didn't know that till the end. You did, you were off. Awesome. Really? Yeah, yeah. I thought it was really good. Oh my gosh! Thank you. When I showed up to do the um, recording of it, I had no idea that I had to change my voice for different characters. Like they didn't tell me that ahead of time. <laughs> and so my accents are so embarrassing. I cringe every time, but um, it's one of those things where I never thought I'd get to do it. So I'm just stoked to have done it. Dave, the, the whole time Dave was reading the book, uh, he was like, I wonder if this is her that's doing it. It's so good. <laughs> uh, is that true? It yeah, is. And at the end I was like, it, it was her. Pay attention until the end. Okay, so Tiffany, when we first start this podcast, I uh, I picked up your book, and I couldn't put it down. So I was telling the guys, and then after it, I was like, I looked you up, and I emailed you, and I was like, it's a shot in the dark. Um, and then you got back to us, and I was just I like fanboyed hard. And I was like, <laughs> she said she would come on the podcast, and was just like over the moon. So thank you so much. Oh, you're not going to tell the rest of the story. No, absolutely not. Really nice of you. Water under the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so what we do most times, Tiffany, we just uh, we get our guests to uh, kind of share their stories um, with addiction, um, kind of the recovery stories, what works for them, and, and so on. I mean, we won't give away too much of your book doing yeah. so, but, uh, you know, we'll encourage listeners to go out and pick up their copy. Um, so um, let's get started. Can you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm sure like most people, it was never my plan to grow up and become an addict and just destroy everything. It was never, it wasn't even on my radar of something that could happen. Um, my stepfather was a police officer. So I grew up in the house with a cop. And so I knew right from wrong. It was constantly pounded into my head and as a result of that, I feel like I was a really good kid. I got great grades. I was involved in cheerleading at school. Um, and I was a really great kid. And my senior year, somebody offered me a sip of alcohol. Prior to that, I had always said no, because I, you know, my dad was an alcoholic. My mom liked drinking and everybody partied. And I was hyper-focused on doing the right thing. Um, but for some reason on this night, I said yes. And after I took that first sip, it kind of woke something up inside of me and introduced me to a feeling I never knew existed, which was numbness. Like I always thought I had no problems and everything was okay. Um, but then once I felt nothing, I was like, wait a minute, this is it. Like this is, I feel like what normal people may be feel like. And so I chased it. And three months after having that first sip of alcohol, I ended up dropping out of high school. Just, I went from being captain of the cheerleading squad to like kicked out of my parents' house, sleeping on my friends' couches, getting drunk all the time. And as these things do, it escalated and the drinking turned into smoking weed. And then um, eventually I was introduced to my drug of choice. I don't know how in-depth you guys get about drugs, but um, I'll just say opiates was my drug of choice. Yep. And the, the first person to give it to me, handed it to me and said, you are going to love this. And I took it and it was the best I had ever felt in my life. And they were right. And I loved it so much that I never wanted to go a second without it. 
and it became my number one focus and my biggest love of my life. Everything that I did revolved around the feeling that I gave them. And so I would work just to make money, just to get one. It started with one a day and I thought it was manageable. My mom ended up dying of cancer and I found out I was getting a trust fund and I was like, I'm going to do the right thing and like go to rehab. And so I did, but I was pissed because they were telling me that I couldn't smoke weed. And I was like, weed and drinking are not my problem. It's opiates. So you guys are stupid. And I know a lot more than you do. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) I was like defiant the whole time. I didn't get it. I was in rehab because I thought that's where I was supposed to be, not because I wanted to be there. And so I celebrated my graduation from rehab by drinking and uh, getting drunk and having a party. Uh, And I hadn't relapsed on opiates, so I thought everything was okay. And then a couple of months later, I met a police officer at a bar and I was like, this is perfect. Like, this is exactly what I need in order to not do drugs ever again. Because I remembered what it was like to live in a house with a cop and the stability that it provided. And so um, the weird thing about addiction is like, it doesn't care who you're dating. And so (laughs) I um, ended up relapsing and hiding my drug addiction to uh, from him for about two and a half years and it escalated like I would always measure how bad I was based on the fact that I wasn't using drugs um, I don't want to get into too much detail like I don't want to trigger anybody but I wasn't administering them a very specific way do you know what I'm saying do you guys talk about <laughs> it, it and I just look sense to me <laughs> really stupid right now no, that's yeah, no we, you can go right in depth. It's, we talk about whatever. Do you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. I ju- yeah. I just, I'm always so nervous that somebody's going to be listening for hope and be like, she said, I be, you yeah. know, and that's all they need to hear to yeah. go. So um, I really like how you like, uh, you make it, it's not funny, but you make it funny. And that like, <laughs> even in, even in your book, like, I don't know, I belly laughed so many times. Aw. <laughs> thanks it's so nice to hear this can I tell you why because I get feedback mostly from women for the most part it's very rare for a guy to reach out to me and tell me that he read my book and it resonated and so to hear it it's like a very new feeling for me to hear this so I it's very cool and I really appreciate it even uh like in your book the one thing that resonated with me a lot was when you said uh, like when I'm not going to say what you were saying I don't want to spoil it for anyone but it's okay uh, nobody has to get it it's um, you can talk about whatever but after the fog after the fog or whatever and you belly laughed for the first time that happened to me in rehab especially with these two guys a lot because that's where we met and uh, I know yeah. I want to hurry up and tell my story so I can hear your guys' story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, okay. That's that's my rant. <laughs> that's really cool. So you were with them the first time that you belly laughed again, or? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. That's yeah. so crazy. Yeah, I think that like feeling of getting sober and like realizing that you can actually have fun sober is something so amazing. Yeah, and it's like. I was still in a place where I'm like, all right, I'm not going to get my hopes up about this feeling because usually like anytime I would have a good, happy feeling, it was overshadowed with fear and doubt. And like, things are going too good to be true. Like something bad's going to happen, but everything was new and exciting in recovery. Every stupid little thing, once I got clean was so exciting. So anyway, speaking of, I feel like I'm jumping ahead a little bit. There was a tiny significant thing that happened between when I got clean and uh, when I was dating the cop. And that was that I was um, arrested and charged with 20 felonies. Um, I had been stealing things from around the house and pawning them. And I didn't think it counted as stealing because um, we lived together. So I was like, this is our Dremel tool not just yours, because I live here too. And um, I really just got out of control. And as my desperation grew, um, my morals dropped. And I was so afraid that he would find out the truth about who I was. 
and I would lose everything. I would lose him and the house and our dog. And so the fear of keeping this mask on or having the mask fall um, was so overwhelming that I would do just about anything and everything to keep it up. And um, the universe intervened in the form of the police department knocking on my door um, because I, listen, people are gonna think I'm a real D-bag after I say this, but I, I was super desperate and I staged a burglary at our house so that I could get the money out of his wallet because it, it was just us there. So if his $200 went missing, he would know it was me. So I, my addict brain was like, I got an idea. Let's just stage a whole ass burglary because that's gonna be way easier than just asking him for two. I don't know. I can't even, I have no clue what I was thinking but it was very elaborate. And when he came home and was, you know, so upset I just, I acted, you know, I can't believe this happened. I'm so sorry. I got to go to work. Um, but we'll talk about it later. And when I got home, the cops were there fingerprinting um, to find the culprit. And I was the culprit the whole time. Um, and that's what's so weird when you're in the midst of your addiction, like material things are no longer material things. Like I would look at, you know, a necklace that I'd been given at birth and be like, this will get me through today. And then if I can just get through today, I'll come up with a plan tomorrow and be done and it'll be fine. And, and it never happened. I was never strong enough. So I was arrested and it was very awkward getting interrogated in front of a bunch of people who I'd been hanging out with for years and been to the baby showers and stuff. When you did get arrested there, <clears throat> um, when I was, when I was listening to the book anyway, it, it sounded like you were a little confident that you had gotten away with it um was that the addict in you you thought you had a you had a one over on them and were you were you actually that calm like pretty or are you kind of no I literally thought that I was going to be leaving that night and getting Taco Bell like I thought this is wasting my time I think that you know when you're an addict you become such a good manipulator and liar and it just becomes so ingrained in your DNA that it's second nature I thought that I could talk myself out of anything and everything and be believable. And I, I really thought that I had them. Like they had the proof about the pawn stuff, obviously, because they had my fingerprints and my license and my signature. And, um, but as far as I left the gun part, out, maybe subconsciously, um, but I ended up stealing. Oh, it made, I hate this. I don't hate it. I mean, I've learned to cope with it, but there's no fancy way to say what I'm about to say. <laughs> Um, I was really desperate and my drug dealer asked if I was able to get any guns. And I said, yes, I have a whole safe full. What do you need? And I exchanged, um, my boyfriend's guns for drugs. And it wasn't until I was like in the interrogation room and this cop was an inch away from my face. And he's like, you need to tell me where these guns are because you just put guns in the hands of one of the most dangerous people in our town and I need to know where they are it didn't matter at the time like I didn't care I wasn't thinking about it it was all about me and what I could get and um it's it's so crazy because I just can't fathom doing something like that today but it was not even a second thought back Tiffany, I found that part of your book really difficult to read. And uh, I kind of, I kind of found like when I was reading, I was like, man, she beats herself up in, about it so, so much. And because uh, I kind of like, I do understand that feeling of like, you're not really thinking about the consequences of your actions. You're more so like you're focusing on, you know, getting high and you, you do the kind of stuff, to, you know, and uh, in your time in sobriety, have you been able to like, kind of find forgiveness, I guess, or, or like cope with it or deal with it? Um, from him specifically or in general? In general, like uh, any, you know? Oh yeah. I, first of all, I had to, this sounds so cheesy, but I had to forgive myself first before I could seek it from other people because I, I realized once the drugs left my system and once I made the decision to get clean and, and learn how to live drug free, I learned how it changes 
uh, the, me- the mechanics of our brains. Me- it does something to our brains. <laughs> um, and so I desperately sought forgiveness for the things that I had done. Like I couldn't apologize and make amends fast enough. I have not uh, reached out to him, specifically my ex-boyfriend, because I know that it, it, it would do more harm than good. And so there were random, I did such an in-depth, like fourth step and making amends to people. And, but when it comes to him, this is the weird part. Like, I don't want to give too much of it away, but um, his wife ended up reaching out to me and saying, I really wanted to hate you for all the things you did to him, but um, I see what you're doing for others. And I just want you to know, I think you're amazing. And so we started talking and then we hung out. And so now she keeps me up to date with his level of hatred for me. And when it's <laughs> low enough, I'm sneaking in and making a mess <laughs> for sure. But I, you know, I wrote him a letter from jail. I wrote his parents a letter, but my motives were all wrong when I wrote those letters. Mm-hmm. It wasn't because I was truly sorry. It was because I was hoping, you know, maybe he would put a good word in for me and get me out of there. Like I wasn't in the right mindset. I was going to ask you about, um, and maybe it was the guys could jump in as well, but you know, we had to talk about, I mentioned something about, you know, rock bottom. I was having a conversation at uh, a rehab and I know one of our counselors got mad not to use that word. And I know that, um, you, you had mentioned that in an interview that jail was, you know, was rock bottom. I'm just curious, like if you were to give like a piece of advice to like someone that's in active addiction that maybe thinks like, you know, they're blurring the lines or the line keeps getting pushed and they're not at their rock bottom yet. But, you know, if they look back, I know, you know, 20 years before, maybe that would have been their rock bottom. Um, is there anything you can do or do you think they just have to go through it? And- I think it's tricky. I Like I get why the counselor got upset because it's like, you don't want people to think that they have to hit their rock bottom in order to change. Like I get that. But I think that for a lot of people, for, let me speak for myself, for me, my rock bottom, which is like, I couldn't go any lower other than death. The worst possible scenario for me was being in suicide watch in the jail, naked and withdrawing from drugs with nobody to come save me, nobody to call and nowhere to go. If they did for some reason release me, I would have nowhere to go. Every single bridge was burned. And so for me that I needed that moment to realize it was up to me to save myself and that nobody, you know, I think for so long, I kept waiting for the answers to fall into my lap or waiting for someone to kick my door down and say, I'm here to get you off of drugs and save you and make you live happily ever after. Like, and that never happened. And, and it took me being humiliated, stripped of everything, including my glasses, but mostly like my dignity and my self-respect. It took me losing all of that to become willing to fight with everything I have to be different. And I think that the person, in my opinion, has to want it and become willing to fight, to change everything in their life. And if you don't see a reason or a need to do that, then you, it's going to be a lot harder for you to do that. I don't think you need to be arrested to get clean. I don't think you need to be chained you know, to someone's closet while you withdraw and detox. I just think you need to be like, they always say sick and tired of being sick and tired. And, you know, it got to a point where I used to pray for death. Every morning I would wake up and be so pissed to still be alive. Like, cause then I have to live another day and I have to go through the motions and I have to figure out how to get money and get drugs and how to lie and manipulate. And if I could have died, it would have been so much easier. And even so much so that I tried, you know, in jail to end my life. And just because dealing with the consequences of my actions seemed like way too much work. And I didn't think I was strong enough to do it. And now with my life, the way it is, I look back to that time and I'm like, holy crap. I had no way of knowing back then just how freaking amazing my life was going to get in recovery. And I can't believe I almost missed it. To what point did you, um, 
decide to start writing the book? Was that something you, you know, started thinking about after you were out and, and maybe doing some talks and stuff uh, or what part of the process was that? So it was never supposed to be a book. I, um, I got pregnant in a halfway house, uh, which I don't recommend if anyone's listening in a halfway house, like don't sleep with the drug addict down the street in the other halfway house, because it's hard to focus on your recovery when you're growing a human person with someone you don't really know. But that anyway, I got lucky. So, um, I, I had this baby and I got married five months after meeting the guy. And then when my kid was six months old, we had another baby. I mean, not that quick. I got pregnant again. And then nine months, obviously you don't have babies six months apart, but I went from being a single lady in a halfway house to a married mom of three in two years in recovery. And it was very overwhelming. So I was like, I'm going to become a blogger and I'm going to write articles about motherhood. And, um, it felt really stupid. It didn't feel real to me, you know, like 10 ways to make your Saturdays fun with your littles. Like that was no offense to anybody who wrote that article. <laughs> you know, the lady who wrote it's listening. She's like, Son of a <laughs> um, but it just didn't feel genuine to me. So I was like, I'm going to tell people about what it's like in jail in case they're on the fence, about <laughs> whether or not jail's right for them. So I did, I, I started writing this article. It was supposed to be one article, but I was like, I have too much to say. So I turned it into a series and every Wednesday, a group of ravenous supporters would show up like dying for the next chapter. And I never expected that to happen. And my page grew and, um, and then I had been, I don't remember how many chapters I had done, let's say 20. And I got a letter from a mom who's like, my son is in jail. And I wish more than anything, I could send these blogs to him because I feel like it would really help him. And then a light bulb went off and I took all the blogs off the website and I Googled how to write a book and format it and publish it. And I self published it. And my supporters are so loyal. There were so many typos in the book, in the first book. Like one person's name was Sarah. And then on the next page, it was Katie. Cause I forgot what I named her. Like it was so bad, but everybody's like, we support you. And they did. And they supported me so much that it ended up getting uh, picked up by random house publishing. And now it's in bookstores and stuff, which is friggin' nuts. Tiffany, um, when you first published the book, was there any bit of like nerves about everyone kind of hearing your story and were you, were you shocked at the amount of support that you got? There was, there was nerves. Um, but I, the little bit that I had put out, the amount of people that supported me was overwhelming. I remember talking about addiction for the first time and expecting people to be like, you're a piece of crap, loser, junkie, lost cause. Like I fully expected it, but I was like, if it helps one person, it's worth it. And I got so many messages and emails from people thanking me and saying they got it. They understood they're the same way. And it really like, I was taken back by the amount of love and support. And it gave me the strength to keep going. Like if I had put it out there and everybody was like, this sucks, boo. Don't talk about drugs on the internet. I would have been like, no, you're totally right. I should not. But the, the amount of, for the first time in my life, I felt okay about who I was and the choices I had made in my past. Um, and I didn't, you know, without drugs, it was the first time I ever felt accepted for exactly who I was. And, I, you know, I'll never be able to thank my supporters enough for that. But I think people are afraid to talk about, you know, the truth of their addiction because of judgment and fear of people um, having opinions, but it's not that, I mean, people are so, understanding there's some a-holes but for the most part the people who love you are going to be so happy that you're sharing your truth and getting help um tiffany do you find that uh it hard to tell your story still even though you have a book have lots of people know it do you, does it trigger you or anything when you are talking about it or get emotional ever um i don't 
it doesn't trigger me anymore. And I think that's mostly due to working with a sponsor for so long, who's helped me cope with all the shame and guilt that comes along with all the really crappy stuff I did. I get emotional sometimes when I talk about my dad. Um, if it wasn't for my dad, I really don't think that I would be sober. Today, he came to visit me in Chris, uh, on Christmas in jail, and he was the only visitor I had. And he had been an alcoholic my whole life. And when he got there, he told me that he had cancer. And because of that, he had gotten sober. And I just couldn't believe it because I couldn't picture him being sober. And he's like, now you need to get your stuff together and get out of here so that we could do this recovery journey together as a family. And that was the first time since getting caught that I was like, wait, somebody still loves me despite everything I did. And I didn't feel worthy of his love or any of what he was giving me. And so, um, you know, I don't want to spoil anything, but you know, so now when I talk about him, I get emotional, but, um, but no, for the most part, I am um, dead inside. So I don't, I'm just kidding. I, I, I don't, I'm just kidding. I, I think I've told it so many times that um, it doesn't affect me really anymore. I, I'm so at peace with the past, you know? And I think if, you, if you're in recovery long enough and if you work hard enough, on making peace with your past and it gets to a point where it doesn't trigger you or make you feel pangs of guilt. Tiffany, um, I had a question about, uh, you mentioned being sick and tired of being sick and tired so, type thing. Um, would you say that's kind of like the main difference between the first time you went to rehab and the second time? Like you kind of had different, different motives for getting sober? Oh my gosh, yeah, absolutely. The first time I went to rehab, you know, like I mentioned, I felt like it was the right thing to do. I was new to drugs. Like I wasn't stealing yet. I wasn't doing dirty stuff in the dark for my habit. I had enough money to buy it. So I didn't know the true, uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. I didn't know how low I could go at that point. And so much happened between then. And the second time I went, I experienced things that that I never knew I would do, you know, I mean, when I was in addiction, this is not going to be cute, but like I would go so long without showering because the water made my body feel really painful. And so I would put off showering as much as I could. I would stay in the same sweaty clothes because the minute my air, the air hit my skin, it felt like I was being stabbed and I was withdrawing. Um, I would lie to people's faces and steal money right out of their purses and Um, just do really horrible things. And I think that at the end, I knew I was either going to die or I was going to be caught. I knew that it couldn't go on like that forever because that's no freaking way to live. I was miserable, but I didn't have the balls to make it stop. After, I guess, rehab, you said five months, you got pregnant. Um, how, How old are your kids now? Uh, six, seven, and my bonus daughter is 11. Okay. Um, so my question, like I've had a similar experience, like uh, my girlfriend's pregnant right now. Um, she's expecting in May. So I'm super excited. And, um, I'm like, I, I like asking guests this question, like how they communicate with their children. Um, so, cause I want to do it like the best way possible. So, um, do you have any advice for kind of communicating with your children and talking to them about addiction and whatnot? Yes. Is this your first baby? It is. Oh my God. I'm so happy for you. (laughs) Thank you. So exciting. Um, I'm going to be so honest. I'm going to be too honest. I'm going to be embarrassingly honest. Um, because number one, it's all over the internet, but number two, like, um, you know what I'm saying? Like all they have to do is Google me and they'll see, Oh my God, my mom used to sell her body for drugs. That's crazy. So I want to get a head start and tell them that before they have a chance to Google. (laughs) Um, but I feel like if I leave that line of communication all the way open, um, that it's not going to sneak up on them and surprise them. Like people used to talk to me about addiction, but they used to describe it like creepy old dudes living under bridges and, you know, robbers breaking into your house. Nobody ever said, 
it's, you know, the doctor who practiced medicine for 10 years and had millions of dollars and a wife and kids. Um, nobody ever described it like that to me. And uh, so I just, I want them to know the truth so that they can be prepared. And I think that we as recovering addicts have an advantage because we know what to look for um, <laughs> in our kids. You know what I'm saying? When they start Absolutely. showing signs, it's like, wait a minute, you can't play a play a, like I've been there, I know <laughs> what you're doing, but it's gonna be great. And as far as being a parent, like people, are, I'm sure your wife, wife or girlfriend or whatever, yeah. um, knows that people are always, you know, offering all kinds of advice, even when you don't want, especially when you don't want it. But none of us friggin' know our kids. Um, the stranger at the supermarket doesn't know your baby and you're not even going to know your baby. And just when you think you know your baby, they're going to do some crazy shit and do something. And you're going to be like, okay, this is a different kid. And so I think, you know, you can try your best to prepare. Um, but all they need is love, really love food. And like maybe diapers, it, you know, it's not required, <laughs> but I'd recommend it. Um, but yeah, honesty is I will never sugarcoat it. They're so young now though. I don't think that I need to go into detail about drugs at this age because it's not relevant to their life. But when I feel like they can comprehend it based on their maturity level, I'll totally have a combo with them. Incredible, thank you. Yeah, yeah like my uh, daughter, she, she like knows what days I go to AA meetings. She's, oh, daddy, you have a meeting tonight or are you going to do your snowman podcast tonight? Uh, <laughs> How old so is she? Two. Oh my Almost. God. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's, like doesn't really know any better, but she knows that I'm, she knows that I was away and that I was doing, and doing things to better myself and my family. Oh, that's so amazing. Other people as well. Yeah. And there's always kids running around meetings. It's a family thing. You know what I mean? And they might not know where they are, or why they're there, but um, the kids are such a big part of our, our lives. And so they're going to be, um, I, I just think people in recovery end up coming out on the other side better than they would have been otherwise, because in recovery, you learn what it's like to have nothing. And so you appreciate everything. And I think you learn to have empathy and not judge people based on their past. And you're given tools on how to be a good person constantly when you surround yourself with good people. And um, I think our kids are really lucky. Okay, uh, Tiffany. Yeah. So fast forward. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to go get to your show May 28th in Calgary, Alberta. Oh, that's nice of you. Um, so can Let's you tell us about getting into stand up and your tour? My name is not mom. Thank you for asking. That's really nice of you. I, uh, I'm terrified of everything in life. I have very bad anxiety. That's what this documentary is about, by the way, the people who are here right now. Um, it's about comedians with anxiety. And uh, so right before this podcast, this is not your question. And I'm so sorry. I'm going off the rails, but I just want to let you know that nice. right before <laughs> I, came on here, I was doing exposure therapy. And was bawling my eyes out. And they're like, you have five minutes to your podcast. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm just going to tell them that with early. Like, it's so traumatizing because my brain is still messed up. Even though I'm clean, like all this stuff is still there. I just, I'm now dealing with it. I'm going to do it. Anyway, so I have stage fright is where I was going with this. Um, but I challenged myself to step out of my comfort zone and just see what happened. And the first time I did it, I felt higher than any drug I'd ever taken. When I got off the stage to the sound of people applauding for me, I was like, I don't care how scared I get. I'm going to do it. So I had, I headlined my own tour in 2019 and 2018. Now I'm with two other moms, which makes it easier because they're my friends and we're together. So just like if you guys went on tour, it wouldn't be as scary if one of you did, but yeah, we're going to Canada. Listen, Canada does not play about who they let in their country. Can I just tell you, if you guys could put a good word in for me with the president Captain of Canada, I, I'm not even joking. I have spent weeks filling out paperwork, getting fingerprinted, talking about my life in detail. They want to know every job from the time I was 14. I was like, 
I was on drugs. I don't remember. Like, that's why we're doing this. Why are you asking me these questions? They listen, they, they, they're very um, careful about who they're letting in. So it's always been my dream to go to Canada. Everybody, I love, I just, I'm so excited to be going. If, you know, fingers crossed, I just mailed off the paperwork from the FBI. So if I get the green light, I'm coming there and it's going to be great. Perfect. Yeah. I don't know if it, well, you know, if your wives want to come or girlfriends or lovers or boyfriends or whatever, I don't, uh, we'll give you tickets. Just let me know if you want to go and we'll give you guys uh, tickets. You don't have to pay for them. Are you going to Toronto or Ottawa? We are going to, oh, I'm a terrible person. I'm so bad at this. I believe Toronto, Vancouver, Calgary, Alberta. Yep. Some of them have two names. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was looking at it, I think, last night. Yeah, help me. Where? where you're going I to, uh, I think you're going to Toronto and to uh, Montreal because yep. uh, they they didn't have the province included on the list. The what? The province. It's like a state. Oh, yeah. See, Vancouver, <laughs> BC, Calgary, AB, Toronto, yeah. no letters. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's where we're um, going. Well, I might uh, head on over. I'm right near Toronto. You should. Yeah, or you can watch the kids. Make the drive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you should. If you want to come, let me know and we'll get we'll give you guys tickets. If you drive from Alberta to Toronto, you can I'm right on Lake Superior. You can stop in. At your house? Or you're the lake. Fly, you're probably flying though. It's like a 30 hour drive. Oh yeah. I did it last week. It was horrible. Wait, there's a 30 hour drive between two of the places I mentioned? Oh yeah. I think you, I think you start you go Vancouver. Calgary and then your next one is Toronto and that's like that's a fun wow. yeah you're driving yeah it's I you're drove driving. it last week I drove from Ottawa to Lethbridge Alberta how, and how big Greece. is Canada that's a long it's pretty big time I am I feel like that's what we're doing nobody's <laughs> mentioned any I mean maybe I'm wrong but I'm it's a lot I'll be too tired to stop by your house unless you have snacks <laughs> or unless you just meant stop by the lake and you're not inviting me over at all. Then there's <laughs> I'll get into it. <laughs> I stopped um, there on my drive. It was great. <laughs> wow. So do you guys don't live near each other? Who just moved? You. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Exciting. Fresh start. Mm -hmm. That's good. You guys, any of you live near each other? Uh, no. Yeah, we so we met in rehab. Um, That's what I'm saying. And then you yeah. just. Yeah, I'm originally from the East Coast. I'm from Cornerbrook, Newfoundland. So you definitely never heard of that place. Two names. Yeah, That's exactly. And then uh, I went up to rehab in Ontario at a place called Newgate. Um, and that's where we met these fine gentlemen. So does that mean you all have around the same time? Clean? Well, you know what? I'm not trying to put you on the spot. What if one of you went out and it's a sore subject and I'm bringing it up? Oh, no, we're all, we're all still good to go. Yeah, here. all around the same time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's such great news. I'm so happy for you guys. Yeah. And then, okay, so at, when did the podcast idea come about? When you were in rehab or after? Uh, me and Mark were sitting on the couch in rehab I think watching like I don't know if it was Sunday football or during a group or something and Mark just had something written on a piece of paper and he just showed me and he said that's the name of our podcast and then I don't know we just kind of started it after we were all out for a bit shut your mouth up <laughs> I just got so many goosebumps yeah. <laughs> he just said it like it was a fact yeah wow. it was pretty cool <laughs> <laughs> and Dave was like, hey guys, what about me? And you're like, all right, Dave, come on yeah. in or what? <laughs> no, we were like we were like the three together. I don't know, you close friend group in rehab, I guess you'd say. Or all jived the best pretty quickly. Awesome. What is um is it the same as anywhere as far as addiction goes in Canada? Is it like the same as anywhere you go? Is it particularly bad or good uh the center itself 
I don't know. I just, I, when I picture Canada, I feel like nobody does drugs there. Oh, that's so, so far off. <laughs> I'm very surprised. Yeah, it's that. pretty much the exact same. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. But, okay, sorry, um, I'm done interviewing you now. Um, yeah, no, I think, uh, I think the stats are around the same as in the States, really, which are way too high. Um, There's, it's so bad. Mm-hmm. It's been, you know, I, again, I don't know if there's a correlation, but I feel like, is there, sorry, I swear something's happening with the lights and it's tripping me out. Um, I feel like people who have been given a second chance at life hit the ground running and they're like, we're going to do some cool shit to help other people. Like all of the addicts that I've met are so ambitious and they're never content with just, you know, being all about themselves. It's always, you know, I want to, I want to give back somehow. I want to do something. I want to create something. And I, um, I'm constantly thinking like, man, I wish that, you know, I could somehow use my platform to create affordable addiction help or create affordable mental health help and stuff like that. Do you guys all, you know, are you guys always brainstorming on how long is this? Sorry, this is nine questions in one. How long has this podcast been going on? (laughs) Um, and are like, what are long-term goals? So, uh, we're in month three now. Um, oh, yeah, so it's so like, we're new. Um, uh, ultimately we just want to open up the discussion on addiction and mental health and, you know, encourage people to come forward and, you know, seek help. And I think if we can do that, then our goals are achieved. Right. And, um, one thing you said that time, I think, I, you mentioned like you have that second shot and I think that's why so many people do it because they like they fully understand that it's a second shot at life and they kind of want to do something meaningful so like myself included yeah exactly I I want I, I put so much negativity out in the world for so long that I'm I'm really eager to just put as much good out as I can and so I'm always looking you know for ways to do that and I think what you guys have do you always have gas um or do you ever just shoot the SHIT yeah yeah actually we have uh we try to do two episodes a week one with a guest and then our other episode is uh shooting the sober shit okay you say shit I didn't know yeah. wait it's shot. called sh- shooting this sober shit yeah yep yeah no, it's not. Yeah, yeah that's why I just said that. Yeah, that's why I laughed when you said it. Oh, I was like, maybe he's laughing because I spilled shit and we're not supposed to cuss. No, absolutely not. That's so funny. Yeah. That's so crazy. I found too, like when I was in active addiction and was trying to like go and look for podcasts that would like kind of resonate with me for like, I don't know, being like young, um, I couldn't really find anything really out there um so I thought when Mark said that I was like this is pretty awesome I mean I was pretty hesitant at first I was kind of like I don't know it's a big uh step to kind of air all your dirty laundry out on the internet as you probably know (laughs) Um, so you were nervous yeah but like I I was but I wasn't at the same time but it and it keeps I find it keeps us three accountable and we've actually like I know a, there's been a lot of people that have reached out that have gotten help and stuff just from watching this. So it's pretty, uh, it's awesome. Yeah. I love, you know, the fact that the three of you are um, working so hard to make a difference and I'd love to share it. I feel like there can never be too many resources for people. Thank you. That means so much. Oh. Yes. That's amazing. Thank you. What's the snowman? I, I'm sorry. This is a really bad habit that I have when I get ner- nervous. I just feel like I have to talk a lot and ask questions to break up the silence. And I don't have, there was no silence. I just. Definitely you're killing it. Yeah, it keeps it interesting. And uh, the snowman. Okay. Well, I'm overcoming a cocaine addiction. Uh, uh, yeah. I thought that would be the last three. I'm like, there's no way it's for cocaine. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's me. um off the rails little like uh double entendre you know you can fall off the rails or uh 
quit doing stuff. rails. Yeah. So that's that. Uh, I love yeah. it. And I was like, I was like a hybrid. Okay. Drum. What was your guess about me? Wait, well, do you, you want me to guess what drugs you all did? Yeah. What was you originally thinking? You said cocaine was the last one for me. No. Well, I, when I looked at the snowman, I was oh, like, okay. there's no way that there's a snowman because of snowman. <laughs> like, it can't be that that's why it is. Oh, yeah. And, that's uh, why. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But no, I wouldn't have guessed that for you, I don't think. I would have guessed. I, I assume everybody's addicted to opiates or meth. That's my two guesses at all times. Um, it's very interesting to me uh, when people are addicted to uppers because I am such like a downer person. And so I'm always very intrigued. Like, don't get me wrong. I did lots of snowmen's back in my day. If it was available. I was not picky, yeah. but if I, if I have, you know, a choice. Yeah, one of our, like, uh, we're also trying to get, like, you know, people who are addicted to pretty much anything and just show that, like, lack of discrimination with addiction. So we're looking yeah. forward to bringing as many guests on as possible. That's amazing. I have, um, if I have any, like, ideas or resources of, like, people that I know that I feel cool recommending, like, some people I would not recommend. I feel like they're a little, sh you know, shady, but um, there are some, I have some ideas if you need. Not that you asked for them, but I'm just. No, we love love all the help we can get. I'm such a weird person. I'm like, I'm just gonna take over your podcast and interview <laughs> you guys, and then I'll tell you who to interview next. Like, who am I? I'm so sorry. I so I'm finding that like, I've always been an anxious person, but I used to call it like being a worry wart. Everybody would always joke about me being a worry wart all the time. I didn't know that there was an actual like clinical diagnosis for it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I got clean, I learned, oh, maybe this is why, you know, when I did discover alcohol for the first time and I felt nothing, it's because all that anxiety and overthinking and worrying and second guessing myself went away. And it makes total sense that that's why, you know, I enjoyed feeling numb for so long because uh, my brain is just trying to kill me. And so I've got the drugs out of my system, which has eliminated a gigantic um, portion of my problems. But then when you get clean, you're left with all the feelings and emotions and thoughts that you've been burying for so long. And so that's why I'm every day I'm like, okay, what can I work on today to make myself better and I get really stre stressed out with all the motivation stuff on the internet today like wake up and run around the block and drink water and eat chicken <laughs> with broccoli and do <laughs> like it's a lot I'm just trying to make it through the day and so for me I try not to pressure myself but I'm always learning how not to be a piece of shit I'm always trying to learn um so I'm doing this really in-depth therapy right now. And the old me never would have done it. The old me would have tried to fix it myself or just shove drugs down my throat. But the new me is like, okay, you have to sit through for an hour this torture session because in the end you're going to heal. And it's really important. Do you know what exposure therapy is? Anybody? No, but we'd love to hear about it. I'd love to tell you about it. <laughs> so basically like your first session, you tell the therapist all of the things that scare you and that are affecting your life. And then the second session, they use it against you. No. To give you exposures. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love my therapist so much, um, but it, it's very, uh, it's very draining and I'm doing it because hopefully when the film comes out, people who are scared to go to therapy will be like, if this dumb idiot can do it, I can do it. But I have a very irrational fear of something terrible happening to my kids um, to the point where I don't let them do fun things because um, I'm too afraid that they're going to get hurt or worse. And I, and so that's what we're working on right now is basically subjecting me to my worst nightmare over and over again until it doesn't bother me anymore. I got the question. Okay. So in our shooting the sober shit episodes, we do our, we do these top fives and it's all things 
recovery and sober talk. So the one, uh, my favorite one so far has been top five recovery tools. What are your top five recovery tools, Tiffany? Yes. Um, recovery tools specifically. Or so ways not, to cope or yeah. whatever. With like, yeah. So number one for me would be the worst one probably out of all of them. And that is um, a support group which is the worst because people in talking and phone calls, it's, it, it's so hard for me to do that. But the number one thing I think that's uh, kept me sober is being able to pick up the phone and be like, I feel really crazy right now. And I don't know why. <laughs> and people in recovery are so awesome. They're like, I'm on my way with Starbucks. Let's figure it out. bitch. And it, like, <laughs> that's how people in recovery are. They don't, they'll drop everything to help you. And if it wasn't for that, and I tried to do it alone, I would have failed and I would probably be dead. The second thing is for me, very specific. Um, I really, I realize that some of this is going to make me sound like a crazy person. And so let's just open our minds as we go into <laughs> life. Okay. I... <laughs> I really enjoy putting Zoom recovery meetings on in my headphones and listening while I color. Um, don't judge me. I'm, I'm only laughing because I love coloring. Do you? Know, you? That's, that's very yeah, therapeutic. Big time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for yeah. the reassurance. Because yeah, no, like I, <laughs> thank you for also coloring. Mark your face <laughs> like in shock. Yeah. <laughs> I I don't I remember when I was in rehab and I used to get really pissed off. <clears throat> and the stupid art teacher would be like, "You need to rage color," and I'm like, "You need to rage color." Like, <laughs> no, but now in hindsight, I get it. It's so <clears throat> my mind is always going, 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 going. What can I do next? I'm not doing enough. I need to be a better mom. You know, I need to work more, and so. When I have a recovery meeting and I'm listening to people sharing their strength and hope, and I'm just focusing on coloring the little mermaid, like I'm just at peace for some reason. I don't know why. Um, this is going to be the longest list. I'm so sorry. I like uh, crystals and candles. I have lots of sparkly crystals around my office um, for when I, but that's more for stress, not really recovery, I guess. But I think that finding something that brings you joy to look at, smell, and touch that is always handy is a really good way to keep your mind and your hands busy so that you don't bored and you don't start, you know, romancing the idea of using. Um, <clears throat> what else? I mean, the obvious ones, the boring ones, just for the day and step work. They're not boring, but they're obvious. Yeah. You know what I mean? What about? Um, I'm not going to ask you. You don't have to tell me. I'm not interviewing you, so you don't have to tell me. I just was going to ask what about you guys, but that's not how this works. Some of mine were the boring ones. Were yeah. they? Oh, yeah, journaling. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. I have purchased so many journals, mm -hmm. and I just never write, ever. But I'm like, this is going to be the week that I get my thoughts out on paper. And then it, like, it's never happened. Journaling's a really good one. But you wrote group a book. involvement, I find is helpful. What is it? I find group involvement helpful, but again, it's one of the boring ones. What about meditation? Mm. How do you guys feel about that? I do that every night. Do you? Yeah, with my daughter. Like, how? So, well, she just lay, I meditate and put on like some music and she goes to bed. Oh, I was like trying to meditate with a two-year-old sounds like my worst nightmare. Yeah, but she like lays there really She's quietly. sleeping. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's different. Yeah, that but, makes sense. Guided meditation is so amazing. I used to get really frustrated because I couldn't do guided meditation because my brain wouldn't stop. But once you like practice it enough and you just shut your brain off for a little bit and just travel to a different place, it's so nice. 
first guided meditation and rehab, I remember walking into a room and like, it was just all strangers. They're like, all right, so close your eyes. And I'm like, not doing this. <laughs> no, I do not trust a room of 15 people enough to close my eyes in Got front it. of you guys. It was horrible. But, I get uh, it. Yeah. But I, super helpful. It's so, you know, it's so funny that you mentioned that because I have, I don't remember a lot, but I specifically remember the group meditation and rehab. And I was getting so angry because I'm like, are you guys seriously walking down a path listening to rainforest sounds right now? Because I'm here. I don't know. Like, I was so pissed. I'm like, how am I supposed to calm down? I'm withdrawing from opiate. I haven't showered in a week. I'm not going to go float on a lake. Sorry. But, um, but yeah, once you, once you gain a little bit of peace in your life, then it becomes easier. But I think it's funny. They've tried to do it at rehab. Um, yeah we had to we had to do yoga at rehab like uh now that was just kind of like i kind of enjoyed it sometimes but other times it was pretty just funny <laughs> i mean yoga is great but like i keep going back to as soon as you get off drugs right and you're like learning mm -hmm. how to live and they're trying to teach you they're like all right everybody gather around and do a downward dog you're like <laughs> <laughs> is this seriously what we're doing with our lives? Like, is this, because this is uncomfortable. I don't want to be ass up in a room. Of that's not what I want to do. But if you enjoyed it, I think that's great. Do you still do it? Uh, no, but, and I did not enjoy it at first. Like maybe by like day 20, day 25. Yeah. I could, be I could bear it, but. You talk there's also, like, there's yeah. also 12 guys in like a 10 by 10 room doing it, so. Was it all guys? Is that the rehab you went to was all guys? It was co-ed, but there was only, there was a girl came like, uh, it was my last week or week and a half. Just one girl. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, <laughs> we, actually, we, we interviewed her on, on the podcast. How is she doing? Good. Yeah, she's doing well. Really? Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Three people making it out of the same rehab, like still doing good is huge. And four people, that's, I don't mean to be a dark cloud, yeah. but I'm just saying like, you know, when you, I think about the people who I went to rehab with, when, as soon as you walk out those doors, you have a choice, you know, you can try something new as scary as it is, or you can go back to what you've always known and nothing changes if nothing changes. And it's very interesting to me, the people who, went that way you know they're still in the same place I go and I speak at jails and I'll walk in the jail and I'll see somebody who I was in jail with nine years ago and I'm like why like gosh I wish I wish you could see that there is so much more after for you like so much has happened in the nine years since I quit using that I, you know, I couldn't even put it into words to describe how wonderful it is down to the minute things like paying bills on time and, you know, following up with doctor's appointments and stuff. And I just, my heart breaks so much because I know what it's like to just go back to what you've always known. And I just, hopefully there's a shift. The more people who do podcasts, the more people who talk about it and speak out on it and show others that it's possible. I, I have hope that one day more people will think maybe it's possible for me too you know that's the goal i did have a question mm -hmm. have you been in any pillow fights late recently <laughs> wow. a bit, you're gonna be <clears throat> quiet the whole time dave <laughs> and then you're gonna pipe up with some bowl crit um, <laughs> I, have not, I have not been in any pillow fights, just fun ones. Yeah, not that, uh, that part made me laugh pretty hard in the book, too. It, it, I, I'm just not, I'm still not like a com confrontational person. Like your book, you can go from like crying to laughing to crying to laughing, and it's like. Holy, what is it? It's a great book. That's a really cool compliment. I really appreciate yeah. it. 
it's, uh, <clears throat> I don't know why I'm going through puberty on your podcast. <laughs> Something keeps happening in my throat. I, um, it's a defense mechanism. The humor, it's all I've ever known. It, when things get too real or too uncomfortable, I have to cut the tension. I have to, or I will explode. Like that's how it feels. And so it's very natural to me, even when I was in jail, even, you know, with what I'm going through now with this crazy traumatic exposure stuff, being goofy is just, it's all I know. And so even on my live streams, you know, uh, one comment will be like, your boobs look so nice tonight. And I'm like, thanks girl. And then the next one's like, I want to die and I'm going to do it when I get off this live. And then I'm like, oh gosh, I'm constantly like switching in and out of, um, you know, being funny because people expect that and being heartfelt and serious because people also expect that. And it's, uh, it can be exhausting. I think. Yeah. Do you find like being like a public figure kind of balancing your life and your uh, job now and trying to, is there expectations you feel like you have to keep? Mm-hmm. And how do you think, uh, how do you, how do you do it? Not well, Jared. Um, with the first book, there was, I had 12,000 followers nobody knew who I was and when I wrote it I didn't give a shit what anybody thought I wrote it for me so now I'm in the process of writing my second book and it's been almost two years since I signed the contract because I'm just like what if people don't like this what if they're expecting this and I'm giving them this and now there's you know so much is at stake and so I've been just self-doubt is unbelievable and being in the public eye not that I'm a Kardashian but you know being in the, like people know who I am. And so I feel like I have to live up to whatever expectation they have of me because I don't want to disappoint them, which is stupid saying it out loud. And I understand that just being who I am is probably enough, Um, but I obsess about it. And there's no balancing family and work. Like if I'm doing one, the other one is being neglected without a doubt. There's just not enough hours in the day. There's no way to like, afford to live and like perfectly balance everything else. And so I could give you like a cute answer, but the real answer is I'm constantly teetering back and forth between neglecting my kids and neglecting my job. And I don't know if I'll ever find a balance. Um, Maybe if I delegate more and get like an assistant or a video editor or somebody to help me, but I have trust issues. So it's not easy. It's not easy. Um, I, I even saw your post the other day on Instagram about people saying about the ads. And I like how uh, like honest you are because you don't see that very often people saying that. But uh, yeah. I don't like I don't understand why people don't get that. Uh, I, it's I'm I hate doing sponsored ads. And I don't hate the company. I don't hate the products, but I hate what's going to come from it because every time I do a sponsored ad, I lose 20,000 followers, which fine. If you're not going to support me through this, maybe you weren't supposed to be here, but it's the comments. I'm not joking. It sends me into a depression for a week. And I'm not trying to be dramatic. Like I can't look at social media because of the things people are saying you know, you're just money hungry. Wow. You're just like everybody else. All you care about is money. Quit trying to sell us this crap. We just want your funny videos. And, and I feel like they're right. And so I, you know, they're not, but part of me feels like, I guess I feel like I don't deserve uh, to have this cool life. And I feel guilty about it sometimes when people are like, you're being paid to hold up a box and talk about it. That's stupid. I'm like, no, like you're right. And it makes me feel like there's people who get up every day and go to a nine to five job that they hate just to make enough money to be able to afford groceries. And I get to be like, Hey guys, buy this shampoo. And it does feel unfair. And so anyway, I struggle 
uh, with sponsored ads, but I, if you ever watch any of my ads, I stay true to myself and I've only ever worked with two companies. And if I, if I, that's not true. I regularly work with two companies. I've done one offs with like two or three other companies. Anyway, who cares? If I said yes to every proposal in my email, we would not be having this conversation because I would be on a spaceship cruising the universe with Elon Musk. I would be so filthy rich that I wouldn't even talk to other humans. I, but I, you know, I say no to everybody to remain as genuine as I can. I turn down all this, these offers for promotion. And so I guess to get accused of it, despite my effort to be real, it just hits a nerve with me. So that post that you saw was, I didn't really like believe it when I posted it. I just wanted to feel better because yeah. people were talking a lot of shit. And it's, I thought it was pretty cool to see that. Yeah, Instagram, I don't make any money on Instagram. Um, it's like $3 a week. And so every now and then I have to do a sponsor ad in order to be able to keep making the videos that they like. I think they, they're like, entertain me for free forever and live in bucks. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not the reality. Um, Tiffany, I have one last question for you. Um, you mentioned when you went to rehab, you were, you were like hesitant on giving up drinking and giving up smoking weed. And I seen a video that you posted recently and you're like, if I start smoking weed, like my life falls apart. Right. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it like several times with people going to rehab and like, they'd be like, I still want to smoke weed. And, um, you know, I've had friends ask me too. They're like, so you're still going to smoke pot, like whatever. Um, how, how important is the abstinence for like someone in recovery? I can't say how important it is for someone in recovery ah uh, yes okay <laughs> uh i can say how important it is for me and my yes, how for you <laughs> <laughs> um to me i have to remain and even saying completely abstinent makes it sound like i like i'm in a weird like cult and we must not you know what i mean so i just <laughs> like to say um i can't take any mind altering substances other than Red Bull and nicotine lozenges. Because if I take something and it makes me feel different, there is no on and off switch for me. And so people will say, well, weed isn't addictive. CBD isn't addictive and fight with me about it. And I'm like, I believe you, but I'm not willing to take that chance. Um, because if I smoke a joint today and it calms me down, I'm never going to not want a joint in my hand. And I would like to be able to resolve whatever feelings of uneasiness are going on in me without having to mask it with a drug. And for me, the reality is my problems are not alcohol and not weed and not drugs. Uh, my problems are way down deeper. And those are the, first, that's the first thing that needs to be addressed. It's like, you know, slapping a bandaid on an amputated arm. It might feel good for a little bit, but there's still this friggin' gaping wound that needs to be fixed in order to be healed. And to me, um, I'm much more interested on working on the deep down stuff than just slapping a bandaid on whatever I got going on. I would also like to say one last thing about this subject. I will never tell somebody that they shouldn't smoke weed because I don't know you or what's going on in your life, what kind of medical conditions you have. So I will not sit up on my pedestal and say, if you smoke weed, you're not clean. I, I don't give a shit what you do. I can just tell you that for me in my program with my addiction, the way it is, um, I can't do those things and if you can more power to you but if you're like me you think you can but you can't and you'll find that out the hard way all right guys we have any more questions for tiffany was that mean what i just said um no you know I, what? I don't answer was... i'm not supposed to seek reassurance for things that i said no, no that was an amazing answer yeah, that I phrased awesome. it terrible. Oh my gosh, you guys. Thank you. <laughs> um, cool. 
All right. Um, we'll, <laughs> we won't waste so any awkward. more time. This was not a waste of time. This was wonderful. And I really <laughs> appreciate you having me on and not giving up on me uh, and giving me another chance to redeem myself because I accidentally was a month late for our appointment and they were going to be very nice and not mention it, but we had something scheduled. And I, a month later, I said, are we still on for tomorrow, man? And they're like, Bitch, that was February. And we've already <laughs> written you off of existence. <laughs> and, but they took me back. And forgave me, and I'm very grateful to have gotten to do this. You guys are wonderful, and, and I, I look forward to listening to your podcast. Not just my episode. I won't listen to this one, but I'd like to listen to your other one. Maybe you can come on for a shooting the shit episode one time. I would love to. <laughs> awesome. That would yeah. be amazing. Yeah, okay, guys. I would love to. So if you or someone you know would like to be a guest on our podcast, uh, let us know. Um, and thank you guys very much for listening. We love you, bye.